their dogs and they're playing poker. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey there, real estate fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Duggan. With my personal brand riding an all-time high, I decided to ditch this low-rent neighborhood next to Joe's mom and build a new house. To help me sell my house, we welcome from the new Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, Mindy Jensen. In headlines, evaluating tax software, our friend, freelance finance writer Hannah Rounds, visits the basement to share her analysis of the best and worst available. Plus, we're going to throw out the Haven lifeline to Marie, who wonders about diversifying her investments. I'll bring down the mail with another listener letter. And in the best part of this podcast, yeah, I'm going to share some of my amazing trivia. Don't worry, we're going to get to it, folks. And now, two guys who should have sold their soul for another crack at last weekend, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-J-J. Yeah, I want a do-over on that. Isn't Monday supposed to be the do-over for the weekend? Isn't that what <laughs> Monday's all about? Where you're like, yeah, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I need, I need one more day. Next time we we'll have a Super Bowl party and not invite Doug. That's please <laughs> God. Because hey, everybody, welcome to another Monday on the Stacky Benjamin Show. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter and across the card table from me, not looking hungover at all. You must have gone. Uh, you must have stayed away from the uh, punch bowl yesterday. Oh, no, no. I just don't get hung over. No. <laughs> I, uh, I've got a secret recipe. Liver of steel, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. I've got a genetically modified, I got a GMO liver. <laughs> and also not genetically modified, but so, so, so robo. You're also familiar with M1 Finance, aren't you? Me gusta M1 Finance. <laughs> Stop talking about gooses. We're talking about money. If you're looking for a better way to invest, you got to check out M1 Finance. They've completely rethought how online brokerages should work and make investing enjoyable, convenient, low cost. The way it works is you build an investment portfolio by specifying what percentages of your money you want to go into certain investments, or you leave it to the pros by telling them what you need and they design it for you. And guess what? Now it's absolutely free with a capital F-R-E-E. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash M, the number one finance.com, or download their slick mobile app on iOS or Android. M1 Finance, be invested. Thanks to Harry's for supporting Stacky Benjamins. Harry's is so confident you're going to love their blades. I love their blades, by the way. They'll give you their trial shave set for free when you sign up at harrys.com forward slash SB. Just pay for shipping. So we've got Mindy Jensen waiting in the wings from Bigger, Mindy. the brand new Bigger Pockets Money podcast. Doing very, very well there with our friend Scott Trench. But first, we got headlines. So let's get this show on the road. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. First headline comes to us from Money-ish. Love this title. LeBron James says this is the best financial decision he ever made. And I, Ooh, Ever. Well, I love this. Not that, not that our sports heroes or anti-heroes, depending on where you sit you know, in the sports hero. Heroes or zeros, thing. right? Yeah, absolutely. Especially the day after the Super Bowl here. Just they give so much attention when they do these articles about making good financial choices. Like you've seen Gronkowski who lives off what? He lives off of his endorsements, I think, and saves his entire salary. And based on the endorsements that he does, he can't be living off of very much. <laughs> right. <laughs> Lives in a van down by the river. There you go. Yeah. This written by Katie Hill. She says, these financial lessons from the Cleveland Cavalier star are lessons for us all. Katie says, he's a king on the court and at the bank and Chase's new episode of Needing Dough, a series in which legendary athletes like Serena Williams talk about how they manage their finances. Maverick Carter, James' business manager, talks to the Cleveland Cavalier star about everything from growing up poor to his best money decision. And frankly... James could teach every American a thing or two about how they should manage money. Carter, James' business partner, asked the basketball star why he never talks about money. James says that came from his upbringing at, quote, the bottom. 
in a very poor part of Akron, Ohio, which his uncles taught him about saving money. Quote, if they gave me a dollar, they'd be like, nephew, just spend 35 cents of it and keep the other 65, James says. So I'm now always in my head about saving. What a great early lesson. You get a dollar, spend 35 cents. I like the lessons that these folks kind of send out to the universe based on their upbringing. I mean, I'm glad it kind of went this direction because I was waiting to hear the LeBron only lives on his Air Jordan contract or something. It's like, oh, really? It's really, really, really tough to make ends meet when Nike's paying you $100 million a year. Gosh, I can understand. But I'm glad that but he's... But a mentality... Uh, a menta- we, taking we, the mentality. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. That's but we, what I mean. Yeah, we can all use that mentality of, I make a dollar, spend 35 cents. Save more, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Base your budget decisions. And I think even better than that is, what do you think about just completely untying your expenses from your income. Meaning he's saying, I bring in a buck, I spend 35 cents. What if I say my expenses are X to live? And that has nothing to do with, I mean, don't get me wrong. My, my income's got to be more, right? Right. And I yeah. got to be able to, to cover my long-term goals. But I think a lot of us, we get a nice big raise and what do we do? We tie our expenses to our income stream. Well, this lines up with what you've said to me a number of times and, and on the show a little bit too direct deposit your paycheck into your savings account, spend from your checking account. Yeah. You know, those two numbers don't have to be the same. <laughs> and a lot of times that's that rich dad, poor dad thing, right? Yeah. Uh, where you want to keep, keep your, your expenses are what they are just because you make an extra hundred dollars this week or you drive for Uber or side hustle some money. That doesn't mean you have to go spend all that money right now. He also says uh, he uses this trick when he's trying to curb impulse buying when he's deciding on buying something he doesn't need, he says that growing up at the bottom always creeps into my head and I end up just saying, I don't need it. There's nothing more I could give myself that would make me happier, which I think is also a great lesson. Because he already has like four Ferraris. <laughs> what could I have that makes me happier? But even without four Ferraris, I think that to myself. I think, oh man, that looks great. Man, I want that thing. And then I think, well, that actually make me any happier than I am right now. Mm-hmm. Is there anything about having that sit on my shelf that will make me happy? And usually the answer is no, not really. Yeah. We're in that kind of mentality right now. We, we're kind of doing this backyard project, cash flowing it and kind of slowly getting through it. And we're thinking about spring break trips because it's, <laughs> I figured out why they put spring break where they put it. Because like by that time you're ready to, like you got cabin fever, you have to go do something, you know? And so I'm already already thinking, I know a lot of people have already been planning their spring break for a year. <laughs> I'm all like, spring breaks in a couple of weeks, we got plenty of time. Um, but I want to do something, but then I also want to keep working on this backyard project. And I know if I do a uh, quote unquote vacation or whatever, it's just sunk money. It's just, you know, it'll be fun. We'll have a good experience and that sort of thing. But it's gone. But then I, but then I still don't have my backyard done, right. you know? And so it's quite a challenge. It, I'm not a always saver type of person. I kind of err on the side of, eh, let's buy now. Let's go spend some cash. So, so for me, this is a really tough, tough thing to go through. It's funny. James says he has purchases. He regrets to your point. OG, uh, you and you and King James have so much in common. Yeah, we did a house. He bought in Las Vegas in 2005 being chief among them. He goes, who buys a house in Vegas? He says laughing and he has things he splurges on, namely a car collection. Uh, so sometimes regret some of those decisions, but asked about his best financial decision. I want to and leave. He gets his paycheck for 8.7 million. <laughs> and who the cares? Week. Like, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. Asked about his best business decision. He doesn't hesitate. It's signing with Nike and getting down the beats headphones. The Nike deal could be worth an estimated $1 billion. And James is reportedly set for a $30 million profit on beats. And what's interesting that I want to focus on there to me the fact that the biggest financial decision isn't about saving more, it's about finding more income. And I think for a lot of people, that's the true answer because we, yeah. we, we get so focused on clipping coupons or saving a few bucks on electricity. Let's go find ways to make more money. Yeah. Make it. Go make it. And in our second headline, it's tax filing time. And that means you might be looking at different tax softwares. And guess what? My favorite nerd friend, and she wears that badge very proudly, has been out looking at softwares for me. It's uh, my good friend, Hannah Rounds. Welcome, Hannah. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Yes. And and I love the fact that on behalf of all of us, you took a bullet and look at all of these tech softwares. Does that mean you need to get a hobby? 
I do need a hobby. Yeah, I definitely need one. <laughs> so, so you're like, how do, what's the best way to spend a Friday night? I know what we're going to do. We're going to look at tax software, but I'm so glad you did because you've got a list of the best for 2018 and a list of the worst. And why don't we, let's start off negative so we can end on a positive note, Hannah. What are the ones we probably want to stay away from? Yeah, so the tax software that I recommend staying away from are eSmart Tax, Tax Act, 1040.com, Easy Tax Return, Jackson Hewitt Online. All of those, I say, stay away from just because of they're overpriced and they don't have a great value proposition. Then the other one that I'm sad to say stay away from this year is Credit Karma Tax. And Credit Karma Tax oh. is completely free. So I wish I could recommend it, but it's just buggy this year. So if you want to try it, go for it. But so many people have had technical issues with it that I just can't recommend it. With the other ones, you say that they're overpriced. Are there certain features I should be looking for, Hannah, that they just don't include? So it's not so much features as they have the same features as other software, but they're higher priced or they're, they just don't have a great interface, so they make it too difficult to file your taxes, and you're still paying for it. Gotcha. And on the let's let's turn this thing positive. Then on the other side, there's some names that we've heard of before, and some surprises on your list of the best of 2018. Yeah. So the ones that won't surprise anyone are TurboTax and H and R Block. Uh, TurboTax is the highest price but it's great for self-employed people, for people with rental properties. If you are self-employed and you use the self-employed software, you'll actually get a free year of QuickBooks. So that's a great deal. And H&R Block just consistently offers a great software at a good price. And then there were also a couple uh, surprises on the best list this year, which were Tax Slayer and Free Tax USA. Wow. And how did those end up on the list? So Tax Slayer really surprised me with a great interface. Uh, they support all major forms at a very reasonable price. And they are offering something called Refund Now. So you can actually get a $1,000 refund advance, so zero interest advance. Uh, when you file with Tax Slayer. So they're one of the only online companies that's offering that this year. So really exciting with Tax Slayer. And then Free Tax USA used to be just horrible to use. It was cluttered and ugly and difficult to use, but they've upped their game. It's a really clean interface, uh, nice interview style questions, good knowledge articles, and it's free for federal filing and then twelve ninety five per state. And it's, it's just a great bargain, especially if you've filed taxes once or twice before and you know what you're trying to do. You know, the established two that you talked about, TurboTax and H&R Block, you mentioned that those two may be a little more expensive, which is why they're on the list. But is this, is this generally a case of you get what you pay for? You do get what you pay for. You know, you don't want to be pulling out your hair when you're trying to get your taxes done. But it is exciting to see that some of the low cost competitors are really saying, hey, we're going to provide great value at a low price. So TurboTax and H&R Block are really having to up their game to justify their prices. I'd say they're justified this year, but uh, we'll see in the future. You said that some of them, though, are offering some decent discounts. I know that uh, when you and I were, were talking about this segment ahead of time, TurboTax kind of gives you a, a deal on other stuff if you're a small business owner. Yeah, if you're self-employed, you get a free year of QuickBooks. So it kind of pays for itself if you're a self-employed person. Last thing for you, Hannah, is you have another name on the list we haven't talked about, TaxHawk. And it's funny because I never hear anything about TaxHawk and it shows up on your best of list. You know what? I called it Free Tax USA and TaxHawk <laughs> is the other name for it. It's the exact same software, exact same price. It's owned by the same company. So yeah, you can use either one, freetaxusa.com or taxhawk.com. I'm so glad that this is what you do for fun because you know how much work you just saved a bunch of people? 
Hopefully a lot because, yeah, I have no life. So uh, It's funny. You and I joke about that, but we know that you, you've got a heck of a life and you have a lot of fun doing this stuff. And I do. Uh, yeah. not just this stuff. But anyway, let's uh, talk about where people follow you. If they got questions, they want more. Where do they go? Yeah. So if you can connect with me on Twitter at Hannah L. Rounds, that's where you can see me tweeting out my articles and things like that. And I love connecting with people. If you've got a financial story to tell, connect with me. I'd love to hear about it. Yeah. And the worse the story is, the better, right? Yeah. If you've been scammed, I'd love to hear about it. (laughs) But actually, it's funny because it's a bad time to kind of reach out to you, Hannah. But on the other side, when people get scammed, that's when they need somebody like you who has a megaphone that can tell the world how to avoid it. Absolutely. Yeah. I love writing about it. It's helpful to help other people avoid the scams in the future. Good stuff. Hannah Rounds, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes. Yep. Thank you so much. Big thanks to Hannah for stopping by. You know, it's that time of year, OG. Get your taxes done. Get those taxes done. Yeah, buddy. So I think uh, Hannah's got some great lessons for taxes, but as far as LeBron James goes, OG, the big takeaway? Be really good at basketball. (laughs) man if you don't know mindy jensen you're about to she's about to head down to the basement fixing to fixing to no not fixing to you're fixing to you sound like a midwestern guy trying to fix into okay dare you fix into okay yeah (laughs) yeah uh, Mindy Jensen, here's a multifaceted person we can all learn from OG. You know her as the community manager over at Bigger Pockets, but more prominently, Mindy's flipped just a ton of houses in the past 10 years, one at a time, and doing much of the work with her husband. She lives in Longmont, Colorado, always looking for an ugly duckling to turn into a swan. Recently, she wrote a great book, How to Sell Your Home, The Essential Guide to a Fast, Stress Free, and Profitable Sale. And If you're looking to sell your house, even if you're not looking to sell it now, I think this is a fantastic, fantastic person to know. Mindy Jensen coming down to the basement. Mindy Jensen, have a seat. How are you? I am doing so well, Joe. I have to say that I'm super excited to be in your mom's basement and it doesn't have that musty basement smell like most basements do. That's kind of cool. Everybody assumes that it will. It just smells like old beer. You know. Well, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Have you ever been in another basement that doesn't smell so pretty? <laughs> yes, which is why we try to, listen, we got this great deal on rent. So mom makes sure that we keep it clean for her. That's, well, that, that's, that's kind of the deal. That's the you can do. Absolutely. So you wrote this awesome book about selling your home and you haven't sold one home. Approximately how many houses have you sold, Mindy? Personally, it's been 20 or 30. And when you started selling houses... Did you do it to flip houses? Did you do it because you're a landlord or did you do it because it was your profession? Well, when I started, I did it because I was flipping houses. My husband and I would move into a house, fix it up, put it on the market and sell it after two years to take advantage of those sweet capital gains avoidance laws that we have, or not laws, benefits. Is that the right word? Well, both. Um, I mean, 1031 for the win, right? The 1031 is for investment properties and it's called section 121 or the two out of five rule that is for your personal residence. So I did it as a personal residence. I actually lived inside the houses that I was living. Yeah. Okay. We have a friend here locally that does that down the street. It is a great way to avoid a lot of capital gains taxes and put a ton of money in your pocket. So you've sold 20 or 30 houses. And you see houses that need tons of work, but what's what's the most important work somebody needs to do to sell their house? The kitchen and any smells. If somebody walks into a property and it smells like the cat lady used to live there, that's not a good thing. People the, will walk right back out. The bad news is most people, I think, don't know their smell, right? I mean, they've, they've been there forever. What do you have to do? Get Have a really honest Gordon Ramsay kind of friend that says, listen, your house stinks? I gave that tip in the book. Yes, absolutely. You need to ask somebody to come over because you're right. You can't smell your own stink. Yeah. So, or aroma or, you know, odor. Flavor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Flavor. <Ew. laughs> I don't know where that came but from. But you can't smell it. And every house has an aroma. 
it's an aroma that comes from you as a person. It's an aroma that could come from your animals. It's an aroma that could come from your cat litter box. If it's coming from your cat litter box, you could actually get immune to that as so many people do, which is disgusting. But if you are getting ready to sell your house, you definitely want to have somebody come over. Even your real estate agent, just tell them, look, I've heard that sometimes people can have like an aroma in their house. I want to make sure that my home isn't unpleasant. And if the real estate agent says, yeah, about that, you want to follow their advice. By the, as long as we're talking about that. Yeah. And you say repairs are a number one. Well, if you're clean, and you keep your house clean, then yes, you should have, you know, an updated house. If you, if to sell the house for the most money, you want to have the most updates, you know, the cleanest house, the least offensive smell house. If you're trying to sell your house and you don't have any money to fix it up, it costs nothing to declutter. It costs nothing to keep it clean. And I have seen so many houses where I walk in, I'm like, this is disgusting. How can people even live here? Several hoarder houses I've walked into and I'm like, okay, even I'm out. I can't believe when I, when when we've bought just our primary residences, or I, I am a landlord who owns one home. You know, we'd walk into these houses, looking at houses. Um, to your point, I think this is your best foot forward. Like, why wouldn't you have cleaned off the countertop? Like stacks of junk on the countertop while people are walking through your house trying to buy it. I'm like, really? Yeah, yeah. That's that's my favorite. I really like the realtor photos of the house that they put on the MLS that show stacks of crap and the <laughs> toilet lid open. And, you know, here's a filthy toilet. Let me make sure you see the inside of it. It's really gross, you know, clean up and keep it in show condition the entire time you're, you've got the property on the market so that people can, you can accept showings at a moment's notice. Let's talk about the kitchen then, since that's most important, just, and you have tons of tips, but I just want to go through one each in a few different rooms. And if people want more, they can, they can get the book, right? But, but the kitchen, exactly. most important thing. The most important thing in the kitchen is again, that it's clean and as updated as you can make it. Again, if you don't have any money to update the kitchen, absolutely clear off everything on the countertops, maybe one small appliance, like a coffee pot and clean out the cabinets. You don't want somebody to open up a cabinet and all this crap starts falling on them. You don't want them to open up the cabinet and see them all cram packed with stuff. Like going to Costco the day before you put your house on the market is a bad move. You need to have as open and few things in the cabinets as possible so that you aren't making it look like there's no room. Yeah. Spaciousness. Yes. Yeah. What about the dining room? The dining room, you want to have one dining room table in there, maybe another piece of furniture if it's a really large dining room, but one dining room, set it small. My current dining room table is from Ikea and it has a leaf that goes inside. Put the leaves away and just have the small dining room table, which makes the dining room look more spacious and set the table with a placemat, a cloth napkin with a napkin ring, a plate, you know, a wine glass, uh, silverware, set it so it looks nice. Put fake flowers or fake fruit in a bowl in the middle. You like this idea then that I've read a lot about of staging your house. I really think if you're living in the property and you're trying to sell it, I think staging it with your own stuff that, I mean, you don't want to pack everything up and just live in an empty house. You're living there anyway, make it look nice, but you know, lived in nice. Yeah. Show people what they can do with the room. Living room. The living room should have, I'm assuming a couch. If you have a TV, that's great. You don't want to have couch, 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 chair, 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 table, 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 table. You want to have maybe two couches if there's enough room. If it looks small, then it is small. Put one couch and one table. Have a couple of pillows on the couch, not a thousand pillows on the couch, and then absolutely everything else off the floor. What about the bedrooms? The bedrooms are a great place to show versatility. So you can have a, like a, one room set up as a bedroom, one set up, maybe if you have an extra crib or you have a child still in a crib, you know, put the crib in there. Um, you can set up one as an office. You want to give people different ideas for what they can do with the space. And the most important space to stage is the weird spaces. Uh. I went into, I went into see this house and it was, it had a U shaped bedroom and the U kind of wrapped around the stairs so it was basically a very unusable space. Throw some kids' toys in there and make it look like the kids have a playroom. They just had nothing in there. And I could not look at the build. I mean, I've been in a lot of houses and I'm looking at this house. Like, I have no idea what to do with this room. So you got to give, just not. you got to kind of give the buyer some imagination, like tell them what to do with all this stuff. 
buyers have no imagination. They yeah. have less than no imagination. You want to show them what they can do in every room in your house. And I, if you can't show them in every room, show them in the the odd spots if you have any. I had this in my last house. I had, which I was selling, I was moving right during the real estate crisis. Great time to move. Actually, I take that back. It was a good time to move because of the fact that we were able to buy, because we were going upstream, buying more house, a more expensive house. Even though I got less money for my old house, I also got a great break on my new house. Follow me? Yes, it was It was a great place to be buying. Yeah. That's an awesome time to sell. Right. Going downstream would have been the other way. But I had this accent wall. I'm still angry about this. And maybe you can talk me <laughs> off the ledge. It was a cinnamon colored accent wall. And it went great with the stuff that was in there. But the person I was working with said, you got to paint that wall a neutral color. What did the rest of the house look like? The rest of the house was very um, crate and barrel. <laughs> I guess to put it. So if, if the rest of the house is crate and barrel, then you can have a cinnamon colored accent wall. As long as it, you're not walking into something like, Ooh, what yeah. is that? But just having one accent wall isn't a bad idea. And cinnamon color, what is that? Like a dark brown, like a dark reddish brown? Like a reddish brown. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, and it was one wall. Yeah. One wall. One wall had me paint it. I thought it was awful advice. I thought the room looked worse when we got done with it. And, um, uh, but anyway, it's funny how upset I can get about one wall. I'm like, really? Like I agreed with almost everything else they said about changing our house and, and staging the house. And I think I had great help at that wall. I still, I still to this day go, shouldn't have painted that wall. That that, that would have been. You can say no, Joe. <laughs> What's that all about? Let's, I want to get to that in a second, having the right help in your corner. But before we do that, this idea of a baked cookie smell, is that baloney? People come over, have freshly baked cookies, or are buyers like attuned to that now? I will say that that is not going to make anybody just buy your house. Oh, it smells like cookies. This is the place for me. <laughs> if you have a house that smells like a cat box, people are going to walk out. Got you. If you have a house that smells like baked cookies, people are going to stay. Yeah. At least, you know, to look at the house and then they'll leave. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a baked cookie smell. Let's talk about uh, hiring the right people. You've got a list in the book of uh, questions to ask when you're interviewing real estate agents. We don't have time to go over all of them, but maybe a couple questions that you're surprised people don't ask more often, Mindy. One of the most popular ones that I really like to recommend is asking the agent, what price would you sell my house and why? Because agents will sometimes say, oh, I'll sell it for 300,000. I would list it at 300,000. Well, is it worth 300,000? I sign up with them because I don't know any better. I hear the 300,000. Oh, everybody else is just trying to, you know, steal money from me or, you know, whatever your mindset is. And then it turns out that it's not worth the 300,000 that this agent said that they should you should list it at. It's only worth 275 that eight other agents said you should list it at. I, mean, I don't think you should interview eight agents. Right. <laughs> it's a little like, much, holy. but. But I get it. If there's an outlier and you think it's great because it sounds like more money, you need to know yeah. why they think they can get that. And the thing is, when you list it high and you might be tempted to think, oh, well, I'll just be able to accept a lower offer. They can, they can write a lower offer. They're not writing lower offers. They're going to other houses. They think, oh, this person is way too invested in the house or they don't understand, you know, what the house is worth or whatever. I'm going to have a hard time negotiating with them. I'm just going to go on to a more appropriately priced house. So your house sits there. It gets stale. Even in our hot market of Denver right now, I have a neighbor down the street. I don't know how serious she is at selling. She lists her house every spring at this unbelievably high price. And it's not going to get that price. It sits on the market all spring, all summer, and then she takes it off the market for the winter and then goes back on. This will be the third year she's doing it. And our market isn't that hot. I mean, she's listing at like $75,000 over ask, over what it should be. You know, when you list too high, you're not going to get people making lower offers. You're just going to get people saying, no, thank you and walking away. And then when it comes to that agent in your corner, you've got somebody, am I hiring the more eager person, the brand new agent that's uh, really excited and hoping to start or does experience matter? You know, it depends on your need to sell and your urgency to sell. If you don't really need to sell, you can hire somebody who is maybe less experienced, but has more time for you. 
if you're hiring somebody from, you know, that real estate sign that you see all over your, your city, they're going to be really, really busy. And you may be working with one of, member of their team. You may be working with them, but they have a thousand phone calls to return. So they might not get to you right away. When you're working with an eager beaver agent, you get a call right away. You get, you know, personalized attention because you're their only client or you're one of two. On the other hand, that agent that's been an agent for a really long time has a lot of contacts. They know a lot of people. Hey, I've got this great house. Do you know anybody interested in moving to X neighborhood? So an experienced agent can help you get your house sold faster. It sounds like, especially if they're experienced in your particular neighborhood. You definitely want somebody who knows your neighborhood, because if you get somebody who's outside of your neighborhood, they might not price it right. They might not market it correctly. You really need somebody with experience in your area. Just briefly, what do you think about for sale by owner? I have personally participated in for sale by owner multiple times. It is a great way to sell your house if you don't have a super urgent need to sell. If you don't have to get out of your house right away, if you're not, you know, moving across country for a job transfer, it's great to throw it on the market and see what happens. If you're in a super hot real estate market like the Denver market, you can throw it up on for sale by owner and see what happens. It doesn't gain any days on market or market time, which happens when you put the house on the MLS, you list it on the MLS and then it starts ticking off days that it's been on the market. So, which I'm actually not sure why they share that with you. That would be an interesting question to look up. But it's a tip for other agents. Oh, this house has been on the market for 312 days. Something's wrong with it. Right. Or the seller is not negotiating or, you know, whatever. It tells you there's something wrong with this house. And the longer it's on the market, the longer it's going to be on the market because nobody's interested. Is that Um, a trick too about, you know, and maybe it's the trick with your neighbor, take it off the market, put it back on the market. So it doesn't look like it's been on the market for three years. Oh, well, here's the thing. You can do that. But I, as the real estate agent, can look in the property history, at least on my MLS, and I know on almost all the other MLS systems, uh, you can look into the property history and see, oh, it was on the market last year for this ridiculous price. It was on the market the year before for this ridiculous price. I bet they're not negotiators. Are you saying that buyers aren't as dumb as I want them to be? Is that what you're trying to, is that what you're implying? I am not saying those words specifically. Because I'm always looking when I sell a house, Mindy, I'm looking for somebody who's really dumb and has a boatload of cash. (laughs) You know, that's typically a better choice. You don't really want an educated buyer when you're selling your house because then they might ask you for things and make demands. Yeah. Yeah. So annoying. (laughs) The book is called How to Sell Your Home, The Essential Guide to a Fast, Stress-Free, Easy for Me to Say, and Profitable Sale. I wish we could have gotten to like even 10% of what you have in the book. You start off with what's your why, wants versus needs, the investor introduction, buyer's market versus seller's markets, getting the sale ready, making repairs, freshing up the interior. You go room by room with a lot more that we got here today. Permits, warrants, more, your next home, fair housing laws, interviewing real estate agents, contracts and offers. I I wish this book was thorough. (laughs) Sorry, I just gloss over things. Yes. Where can people get it, Mindy? People can get it on biggerpockets.com slash sell your home. It is also available wherever fine books are sold. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about your awesome new podcast. Congratulations, by the way, on a Thank great launch. Much. And for the three people that don't know about Bigger Pockets Money, <laughs> tell them what you do. So Bigger Pockets Money is actually inspired by the Bigger Pockets podcast, where we interview real estate investors and get their tips and tricks on, you know, how they learned or how they started and what they learned. Um, and Bigger Pockets Money is similar, but for money. We interview people who have a unique take on money or share their story about their money experiences. Like I was super deep in debt and this is how I got out of debt or ways to save money. We have had Erin Chase on with her $5 dinners program to help you save money at the grocery store. We had Rosemary Groner on the busy budgeter with tips for getting your life in order. She was super in debt right? and she quit being a state trooper, which is a recession proof job and went into home daycare because she wanted to stay home with her kids. And then she got out of that, that I think that most people who go into home daycare quickly get out of that too. <laughs> I would totally get out of that. I was a stay-at-home mom. I had two kids and that was enough. I'd either get out of that or I'd take up drinking heavily. What and, and, yeah. and maybe both. They frown on that. Yeah. <laughs> they frown on that <laughs> at as the daycare, daycare providers. Yeah, I can't figure know, out so. why. 
Yeah, cool. And we'll link to the show and to the book in our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Mindy, thanks for hanging out. Joe, thanks for having me. This is like a bucket list check <laughs> Oh, yeah, right. It is for me too, by the way. No, this is on my bucket list. I'm on the Stacking Benjamin show. I listen to this show all the time. Pitch me. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, right. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And based on Mindy's recommendation, I made a list of all the improvements I'm going to make to my house to sell it. Lucky for me, though, the walls nearly all have shag carpeting already. My taxidermy collection of squirrels is all dusted off. Now, maybe I just need to add a a velvet Elvis print. (laughs) And that awesome dog's playing poker. Everybody loves that. But speaking of selling the house, hey, here's a trivia question. How many houses does the average person buy in their lifetime? I'll be back with the answer in just a moment. I said this earlier, and I'll say it again. I love the Harry's experience, love my Harry's razor, and especially the shaving gel is phenomenal. So big thanks to Harry's for supporting Stacking Benjamins. You know, how does Harry's tie into your new year's resolution well if yours is to save money harry's can save you about a hundred bucks a year if you're a frequent shaver and part of earning more money is taking better care of yourself right harry's products have won countless grooming awards and they're going to keep you looking great and feeling great which i think is even better harry's is all about a great shave at a fair price which is why over three million guys have switched to harry's Harry stripped out all that unnecessary stuff, the vibrating handle, heating blades, 15 lubricating strips, and all of those unnecessary costs to deliver customers one perfect razor at an amazing price. A good shave comes down to good blades because Harry's owns a factory. They're able to deliver quality blades for just two bucks a blade compared to $4 or more you're going to pay at the drugstore. All their products are backed by 100% quality guarantee. I'm confident you're going to love their blades, but listen to this. Harry's is so confident you're going to love them that they'll give you their trial shave set for free when you sign up at harrys.com forward slash SB. All you got to do is pay for shipping. So claim your free trial offer from Harry's today, a $13 value for free when you sign up. Just cover shipping. It includes a weighted ergonomic razor handle, five precision engineer blades with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shaving gel, my favorite, by the way, a travel blade cover. To get your free trial set, go to harrys.com forward slash SB right now. That's harrys.com forward slash SB. Hey, stackers, I'm sure you know by now that both my spouse Cheryl and I use M1 Finance for our personal investments. That doesn't make it right for you. You should do your own homework. We'll call that our disclaimer here up top. But recently, we've had exciting news from the team at M1 Finance. They've announced they're now a completely free-to-use investing platform. You heard that right. No fees, no commissions outside of the investments themselves. I sat down with Brian Barnes, CEO and founder, and asked what made him decide to make M1 Finance free. We believe in the future all investing platforms will be free. So it was a decision to get ahead of the curve. It's obviously beneficial for the customer who will save money and be able to invest more. For M1, we have other sources of revenue, which were greater than the fee we charge. So the more people using M1, the better for us as well. So how about that? No fees, no commissions, just you with more money to save and in control of your portfolio. They'll even invest fractional shares for you. You take the wheel or have them invest in a professionally managed approach like some of the robo companies out there. It takes only a minute to sign up. Start by heading over to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash M1 Finance. M1 Finance, be invested. Hey, trivia heads. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And here's a question. How much Febreze does it take to knock out a wet carpet smell from last summer? Asking for a friend. Maybe I'll ask Joe's mom that question in a minute, you know, for my friend. But hey, let's get back to your trivia question now, which was this. How many houses does the average person buy over their lifetime? If you answered 11, you're probably in the witness relocation program. But if you said three, you'd be correct, my friend. Nice job. Hey, go brag to the office about your big win today because Joe's mom's very proud of you. Really, she is. She told me herself. See ya. Big thanks to Mindy Jensen for stopping by. You know, if we're going to sell three houses during our lifetime, probably should know how to do it right. Probably ought to 
get it right. Yeah. I'm always amazed when I walk into houses. Well, I talked to Mindy about that, but I was amazed when I walked into houses and it's like people don't even bother picking up, picking their stuff up. Like some of the houses I remember when we moved to Texarkana, it's like, really? So this is your best foot forward, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like the realtor.com pictures. Right. They're like, seriously, take, take, clean the crap off the countertop before you don't even have to like, you can put it back. Just move it for the <laughs> photograph. Just, just put it down out of the photograph. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like we do when we do our Facebook Lives here in the basement. That's exactly right. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's or rather life insurance's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they're disrupting the life insurance industry by focusing on those two things you value most. Flipping houses and flipping cheeseburgers. I don't know. Mm, cheeseburgers. I had I, I had too much of that yesterday. Uh, no, but it's your family and your time, but that's a good three and four. It's why they created a high value quality, affordable term life insurance policy issued by mass mutual. You can purchase entirely online and qualified healthy applicants. They don't skip to the medical exam. They skip the medical exam. OG head to, which we can't overstate enough. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven life now to get a free quote and learn about life insurance the modern way. That's stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven life. And today We've thrown out the Haven Lifeline to our new friend, Marie. Say hello, Marie. Hi, Joe and OG. I'm looking to invest about five to $8,000 in an investment account outside of my Roth IRA and my Roth 401k, and I'm wondering how much to diversify my investment. Since it's not a huge amount, I was thinking of starting with an S&P 500 ETF and an international stock ETF. Is this enough diversity? Should I be putting the money into other asset classes and commodities like an R, like a REIT or oil and gas. I have a Roth 401k and a Roth IRA, both that I max out. In those accounts, I have mostly U.S. stock, large and mid cap, some international stock, and some bonds. Am I double dipping by investing in an S and P 500 and international stock since I already have these in my retirement accounts? A little bit about me: I'm 30, single, no kids, no debt, and I also have a six month emergency fund in a separate money market account. Thanks for your help, and I appreciate any advice that you can give me. Thank you. Hey, Marie. Don't know uh, that we can give you advice. I don't know how long she's been listening to the show, but we don't do that. Entertainment purposes only. Yes. We're going to throw a dart now, Marie, and tell you where you should invest. This will be fun. Yeah. Um, How about uh, ticker symbol? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) What do I own in my portfolio that I need to go up? (laughs) Wait, does that happen on CNBC? No, it no, doesn't. It? come on, it never does. Well, they no, put the disclosures on there now. Yes. Like Jack owns one million shares of Twitter of that thing he's big on the last ten minutes. Yes, exactly. He's talking the heck out of all this stuff, but it, but it's okay because he's got a disclosure. S and P five hundred international. What do you think? Is that enough diversification for Marie? Not knowing the balances in those other accounts, right? We could surmise what they might be. She says she maxes them out, so we can get a little bit of an idea over the last couple of years. Maybe. You can add a little bit of diversification. I wouldn't do anything so crazy like oil and gas and REITs, maybe REITs, but but not commodity stuff. I'm thinking more like if you've already got some international, maybe you want to add emerging market. Or if you've got U.S. big companies, maybe you want to have some small companies. That sort of diversification. I don't think that you have to get crazy and cute with it. And if you've got pretty well thought out, uh, you know, if they're just ETFs in the 401k and Roth already, then you've got thousands of positions out, you know, already. So you're well, well diversified already. So yeah, I think maybe just a little esoteric stuff, merging market or something, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty well diversified too. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, is good. Yeah. She's got 500 companies in the S and P 500 and how many are in the international index? I mean, she's well diversified. Even if she just told me S&P 500, she's fine. But to your point, I love emerging markets long term. I mean, they've done really well lately. So remember, really well now means really poorly other times. In my time as an investor, emerging markets has been a real roller coaster and it will continue to be a real roller coaster. I think it depends on what her goal is with the portfolio. I've been reading a lot about if you take more risk you obviously have more upside, way more downside. And it depends on if this is a core part of her portfolio or if it's a sandbox part of her portfolio. You know, when she mentioned oil and gas, I too, I saw you grimace and I grimaced also. (laughs) And we kind of gave each other that, no, 
uh, look. But there are some of these, one, one guy on MarketWatch recently called them megatrends, right? There are some megatrends, and if it's your sandbox and you're okay with the Las Vegas nature of a sandbox, look at some of these long-term trends like automation or a trend like, you know, water, like the guy on the big short at the end of the big short is interested in water investments. But I I don't know that I put all my money there, but picking some of these long-term trends and writing the same thing as it is with emerging markets. But I want to really hedge that because it depends on what you need that money for. And that's a horrible recommendation for your core portfolio. Yeah. If it's Vegas money, sure. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Marie. Doug also brought down the mail. And uh, this letter here is from Darian. Darian says, I've been looking around at new banks for my checking and savings account as I become unsatisfied with my current bank. Chase is offering a $350 incentive for new customers who make a $10,000 deposit and maintain $10,000 account balance for at least three months. That seems like a pretty good deal. Almost like a three-month CD with a 3.5% interest rate. My question is, what are the drawbacks to opening and closing bank accounts? What's to stop me from hopping from bank to bank, opening different accounts, and collecting on promotions like this other than just time and hassle? I've been listening over the past few months and have actually really enjoyed the podcast. I don't know why everybody's so lukewarm on you two. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, didn't, nice. I didn't catch that until I'm halfway done reading it. Nice. That's so awesome. Thanks for the question, Darian. We don't know either. Let's keep listening, Darian, because you'll figure out why. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, it's all downhill from here, buddy. Uh, so what's, well, what's the downside of, of just chasing these promotional rates? Well, firstly, when it comes to those offers you get in the mail or email or something like that, it's not just necessarily the fine print of qualifying deposit of $10,000 or more. It's also, like you already mentioned, keeping the money there for a period of time. And a lot of times they have other things that are tied to those and setting up a direct deposit of at least 3000 a month for three months. You know, So you got to make sure that you're reading through all that fine print very well. But you're right. If you don't have a... Uh, problem with spending a Saturday afternoon transferring money all over the place and opening new accounts and, you know, rejiggering your uh, a direct deposit and, you know, following all the rules, there is no reason that you can't do this. I mean, eventually they'll, you'll get through them all, <laughs> you know, and they will stop sending them to you. But um, Stake Brother works as a stockbroker, right, at a company. His company offers incentives for moving money over, like, you know, $5,000 cash bonus, 500 free trades, whatever. And he has people that will move their money there, take their free money and do what they've got to do with it for, you know, six months and then just pull the money out and move it to a different brokerage account because they get another $5,000 and, you know, 500 free trades. And then, you know, they just kind of bounce around the circle. If you're okay with that, fill out all that paperwork, have at it. Uh, last thing, keep in mind that that bonus is interest. So it's going to be taxable to you. You get a 1099 at the end of the year. You know, I just look at so what's so if he's going to put the ten thousand bucks in this and get three and a half percent, we're talking about three hundred and fifty bucks, right? Is my math correct there? Yep, yep, barely, but yes. V- versus if he just goes to magnify money and finds the the point and a half, it's it's uh, or now it's up to one point six, it's one hundred and sixty bucks. So he's making one hundred and ninety dollars by making that move. And I look at well, not quite because he's getting three and a half percent in three months. Magnify money is 1.6. Oh, you're right. It's a $350 incentive. Okay. Well, you know, I'm just doing the math on what's my time worth. And I think I'm. You're woefully incorrect. But what you think is that you're worth more than $150 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. That just, I'm sitting right here, man. Burn. If I spend more time on putting money into my portfolio, and let my $10,000 just be my emergency fund and not pay much attention to it. I'm thinking I get further ahead. I mean, I just, because if I'm focusing on these little, making 1.6%, 3.5% versus making my 8% decisions, my 12% decisions, you know, I... Stopping to pick up pennies and letting the dollars blow by, basically. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I widen the lens and I look at the whole forest, like mom says, instead of the individual branch of one tree, I probably am not worried about this at all. Well, and to your point, you could also argue, well, can't I also do a $20,000 balance transfer on my new credit card at 0% for six months and put that in the account and get 3.5%? Yeah, you can. 
Yep. Yeah, I can spend all day until you screw that up one time. <laughs> right. Well, you know. and, and that one's way more dangerous, right? The credit well, sure card is, game is but yeah, way you're more talking dangerous. About like, is it worth trying to nickel and dime all this stuff? You know, it could be. But I'm with you. I, I would, I would rather. I get more utility out of, you know, laying on the couch watching a football game than than a Saturday scouring the internet trying to find an esoteric credit union that's going to give me 150 bucks more than the national average. Yeah. I mean, and that's an interesting point because Darian might be saying, well, why, why sitting on the, on the couch? How does that, you know, I'm getting ahead of you by making these little moves. Well, when it comes time to make the big moves, you're exhausted. And there's a great group that you and I both know about called strategic coach, where they talk about, you know, you have to have your downtime. You have to have your downtime. Yeah. And yep. uh, I, I mean, Jim, Jim Rohn, I think, wrote a great book about that, about looking at yourself like a tennis player who has seasons going back to the Super Bowl. You know, you've got seasons, you got these, you have these months you can be at. Tennis player is a great analogy versus football because tennis players could ostensibly try to be on the whole year because there's tennis tournaments constantly going on. A great tennis player has to pick the times when it matters. And the rest of the time they're working on things, Right. They're relaxing, they're developing, they're doing, they're doing all the little things, and then they're on on certain points. And I just think if I'm wasting my on time on this 3.5% stuff, I'm not. Anyway, yeah. my, my diatribe. Thanks for the question, Darian. If you've got a question for us, here's what you do. Head to stackingbenjamins.com. Right at the top of the page, it says questions for the show, and we've got you covered. So thanks a lot for everybody also who's left a review of the show. Mom's so, so proud and she puts them on the refrigerator and it's just fantastic when the bridge club comes over and mom's just, you know, she's that person who stands right next to the fridge. Doesn't mention the fact that we're getting these reviews, but just kind of. Have you, have you seen that uh, commercial, the old lady that she has all the pictures on her wall? <laughs> oh, the, the friends. <laughs> she's like, I unfriend you like to the person sitting on the couch and the woman's like, this is not how this works. <laughs> Well, it's like, look at my wall. Isn't that the same one where she's playing Candy Crush and she's got the hammer at the, at the end so. of the, with the candy? Yeah, good stuff. That's they, just like mom. That's totally mom. And finally, if you're looking for good financial help in your corner, OG's taking clients. What does that mean? Well, if you need good help in your corner, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash letter O, letter G. That will lead you to OG's calendar and you can set up a time to talk to him about what that would take. I'll tell you what's going on here, though. Coming up on Wednesday, you're not going to want to miss this. Thursday's the beginning of the Winter Olympics. You're a big Winter Olympics guy. I actually like the Winter Olympics, I think, better than the Summer Olympics. I, I do, too. Yeah. I, I don't like the, you know, I don't do ice dancing and that sort of thing, as you can imagine. But I like the downhill skiing. Well, because if you're going to ice dance, you're just going to go, G. you're just going to go do it yourself. Like watching somebody else ice dance. Yeah. Oh, geez. Super jealous. Yeah. Oh, geez. Totally like, not watching. I could do this. <laughs> right. Yeah. The downhill skiing, the uh, bobsled, skeleton. Super mm. G is my favorite. Ice hockey. I'll take the men's and women's ice hockey. Well, guess what? Speaking of bobsled, we have the American silver medalist in the two-woman bobsled. What? Lauren Williams is our oh. guest. She's a financial planner in Dallas, Texas. And guess what? She's going to talk about Winter Olympics and achieving your podium winning performance with your money. Lauren Williams. She also, by the way, Olympic sprinter. Uh, she's done Summer Olympics, Winter Olympics. We're going to talk to her not just about her Olympic experience, but also about uh, and what it's like going down the bobsled. I can't wait to hear that. And uh, we'll talk money and the Olympics with Lauren on Wednesday. That's what's coming up on the show. Doug, let's wrap this baby up. What should we have learned today? So, what should you have learned today? First, let's take some advice from Mindy Jensen. If you're selling your house, deal first with the repairs and then with the kitchen. And declutter, people. My God, clean up after yourselves. You're pigs. That's the first stop towards a faster home sale. Second, though, take advice from Hannah Rounds. Just because tax software isn't free doesn't mean it's worth using. Consider your time and investment, too, when choosing which program to help you with your taxes. But the big takeaway... Don't take down the shag carpeting from your walls unless you know what it's covering up. Some kid must have thrown some old painting up there. That, I don't know, it's like this stick figure woman. Her eyes and her nose were both on the same side of her face. It was bizarre. And the, like, the signature said Picasso, Pick, Picasso. I don't know. I can't read it. Anyway, 
this goes in the trash, I'm throwing that beautiful shag back up on the wall. Special thanks to Mindy Jensen for stopping by. You'll find Mindy's book, How to Sell Your Home, wherever books are sold. Check her podcast, Bigger Pockets Money, wherever you're listening to this show. Thanks also to Hannah Rounds for stopping by. Say hello to Hannah on Twitter at Hannah L. Rounds. And a huge thanks to suckers who are born every minute. Some guy just bought that pickaxe painting and the stick woman and the crazy face and the... <laughs> Get this, he paid 25 bucks. What a complete buffoon. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter reese and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Kathleen Selmans handles design, newsletter, and classroom opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash classes. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I swear the worst part about coming over to Joe's mom's house is having to put on pants. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. So, you know, I've created this new show, Money in the Morning, and yep. uh, thanks to everybody who sent me messages telling me how much they they like the new show. It's actually way easier to produce than this show, but partly because the deal when I made Money in the Morning was that it was going to be live, one take, and in front of a live Facebook audience. So whatever happens, happens. And we actually, in the first two weeks, I've had to have two takes on a few occasions, Partly because I capture the audio on a better quality, because Facebook Live audio, not that great, but I capture it, the audio, on a special player that we use for this podcast so that we get a better, people listening on Apple Podcasts or wherever, get a better experience. So I have had to do it twice, because I'll look down halfway through the live Facebook thing and I go, oh crap, I'm not recording this. So I get to do Mm -hmm. it again. So, which is always weird when like, uh, you know, Nick hasn't started his job yet, my son. And he said, yeah, dad, I was sitting in the living room doing something and I see dad's on Facebook live. And then five minutes later, dad's on Facebook live (laughs) doing it again. But because it's live, it makes it super easy to edit. Richie and I take maybe 10 minutes uploading it. I mean, it's, it's the whole, the whole thing is not that difficult, but the bad news is stuff happens. And I got to tell you, OG, the biggest nightmare has already happened and the show's only two weeks old. Last Friday, I was getting ready for the live taping, wrote all my stuff out, prepared as much as I possibly could, got the articles ready on the screen that we're going to talk about, had the agenda all written out that we can put on the screen for people watching, all set to go. Mom's doing some cleaning. Unbeknownst to me, just before we we start taping, opens up the door and lets the cat Cooper into the basement. <laughs> and that's happened already on one other occasion where I'll notice people go, oh, kitty. And I look behind me on the, because you've got the video going, I look behind me on right. the video and there's the cat behind me, no big deal. So in this particular case, 
I start up and I go, oh crap. When people in the live Facebook audience go, oh kitty, hey, it's a cat, mom's cat. Yeah, that's great. And so I get through the first headline, which is about wealthy Americans have more student loan debt than any other group. And talking about that, you know, what doesn't seem to make sense, but then walking, right. walking through that. And then we get onto the second one and I'm halfway through the second, the second one when somebody says, what's your cat doing behind you? And I look behind me and the cat has his favorite blanket and he's making it happen. <laughs> No, come on, dude. <laughs> right behind me on Facebook Live. It's such a flipping nightmare. Like it couldn't be, it couldn't be the worst nightmare. I'm talking finance. And at first I'm like, well, it's live. Maybe it'll just it'll go away and whatever. And I thought, no. There, I I don't want to walk into a gas station like six months from now and somebody goes, Hey, I know you. That's what I was going to say. Is this, is this viral on Twitter yet? Cause I'm, I'm going to make it be. Somebody goes, I know you. And I'm like, no, you don't know me. I, yeah, yeah I know you. You're the guy from the, uh, from the, the cat the, video, the cat video. Yeah. You're the, you're the, you're the cat Barry white video guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no, I'm, that's not me. So I'm in the middle of the, t- and, and I just keep talking. I don't remember what I said, but with my right hand, I'm slowly taking my mouse and I'm going over and for those people, those, I think we had 10 people live for those people that were there. They know the video then like abruptly ended in the middle of my sentence. And I went over because we use a separate uh, module to record it. And I, I, I go immediately over to Facebook and delete that video. That video is long gone. Cause what a nightmare that would have been. Darn. Yeah, that would have been funny actually to see. Video, video is is long, long gone. Just and now every time I make sure, mom's not opening that. <laughs> Please, door's got to be closed to the basement. <laughs> Do not, because the kitty might. Uh... Nature, nature might uh, run its course. Yeah, during the want some want some alone time during the stacking bench. <laughs> he didn't want a long time. He's a he's a, he wanted to be a star. He's like, are you kidding me? Check this out, guys. Watch this. <laughs> Look what I'm doing. I can get my own video series. I know. He's got his own YouTube channel. 